All right. Um, so I just want to, again, we do have a few people that tune into the videos after the fact. And a couple of them have said um, that they don't join live because they're worried I'm going to pick on them. <laughs> so I'm going to say on the video this time that I'm not going to pick on anybody who hasn't already given me consent to be picked on. So um, Josh is my usual go-to. Bron's getting more open about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but do let me know if you're interested in being involved in the sort of interactive component of it, just jump in and, and get involved. And if you're not interested, then I'm not going to single you out and say your name and make you answer a question in front of the group. So no need to be worried about that. Um, so this is our first liver section. Liver's kind of stuck into the gastrointestinal section of Edinger, but I think it deserves its own section. I think it's such an interesting organ. It does so many different jobs with so many different mechanisms. Um, so I thought it would be a good place to start just to review what the functions of the liver are. Um, so can anybody think of any? Just throw some out there and I'll just pick them off my answer key as we go. It's a storage organ. Storage organ. Good. What are we storing? Stores um, uh, like fats, yep. um, uh, vitamins and minerals like copper and stuff like that. Excellent. Um, so it's also a kind of a, a big source of glucose production um, as a result. It's like glycogen storage. Excellent. Well done. Um, and the only other thing I've got on my list for storage is actually blood. There's a big pool of blood in the liver. So similar to the spleen, not quite as kind of um, adaptable as the spleen, um, but there's a, a really big pool of blood in there. Didn't Good. know that. That's cool. Yeah. Um, storage organ. What else? Produces coagulation factors and proteins. Some of the proteins, not all. Excellent. Good. So I think a good word for um, uh, sort of looking at things that the liver produces and breaks down is metabolism. So I kind of have this category of metabolism as one of the functions of the liver. And then one of those functions is production and one of the um, uh, functions is catabolism or, or breakdown. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what do they produce? Did you say proteins? Some proteins and coagulation factors, a lot of them. Yep, absolutely. <clears throat> Anything else? Hmm. Glycogen. Good, yep. So carb, carbohydrate. So we've got protein, we've got carbohydrate. What's the other big group that the liver metabolizes? Does it make cholesterol? Yes, yes. good. Yeah, so lipid. Um, so it, it is key in making the different forms of fat transportation devices, so the VLDLs and all of those things. Um, and we'll go into that more when we're doing the pancreatic section because it's more um, relevant then. But carb, lipid, protein, um, metabolism, so both breakdown and production. What about hormones? Motilin. No. Sorry, say again. Does it pr produce motilin? God, maybe. <laughs> it produces some hormones. <laughs> None of the big ones. Um, but yes, there's lots of lots of um, proteins usually that are or enzymes that the liver produces, which participate in um, endocrine function. Uh, okay, so we've got storage. We've got metabolism. Uh, what are the other functions of the liver? Detoxification. Excellent. Good. Very good. I chucked detoxification in the reading for this tutorial. I'm not sure whether you saw that. It doesn't go in. I didn't follow the sequence of Eninger, but I think when we're talking about liver structure and function, Detoxification is one of the main functions and it's a really interesting role that the liver plays in how it does it. Um, so we'll jump to that later and go into a bit more detail, but the liver is the first pass of seeing anything that's absorbed through the gastrointestinal tract. 
Uh, okay, what about immune functions? But is that part of the proteins like CRP and globu uh, gamma globulins and that sort of thing? Good point, actually. So there's a little bit of an overlap there. What do you know about the reticular endothelial system? The liver is part of it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> essentially. Um, so essentially the splanchnic circulation or the kind of portal system is the big filtering system. So it's really the first site after the gastrointestinal tract to see new antigens that are absorbed. So if they make it through the gastrointestinal tract and are in portal circulation, then they're going to the liver next. And the reticular endothelial system has a big responsibility to either ignore or uh, respond to the antigens coming through there. Um, so it regulates immunity with what's coming through. What we know about the liver is that a whole heap of bacteria go up through the portal system. They get in through the mucosa, go up through the portal system, get processed by the liver and excreted back. Um, it's called hepatobiliary circulation or enterohepatic circulation. And they just get excreted back through the bile into the, into the um, gastrointestinal tract. So um, it's a, similar to the gastrointestinal tract in, in terms of tolerance of antigen or developing tolerance of antigen. Um, excellent. So now I want to expand on, what did I want to expand on? Um, and the anatomy of the liver. What blood, what blood supply does the liver get? 80% is portal and then the, the remaining 20 is hepatic. Good, artery. excellent, good. Um, so when you think about that, 80% of the blood flow to the liver is not oxygenated blood. Only 20% is oxygenated blood. So it's living on the edge already. So when we think of the anatomy of the liver, what it, is the portal triad made up of? There's three of them, three things. Hepatic artery, portal vein, bile duct. Very good. Who said that? Me. Oh, sorry, Simone. <laughs> Marsha was nodding at this exactly the same time, but your mouth wasn't moving. I was like, what? <laughs> sorry. Sorry, Kanye. I'm very slow with unmuting, so I never have oh. time. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Excellent. Um, all right. And then, so we've got the portal triad and we've got hepatic artery blood coming in to provide oxygen to the hepatocytes. And then we've got portal blood coming in to participate in that, those vital functions of the liver, participating in detoxification, filtration, um, and using those nutrients in metabolic processes. Where does that blood then go once it's sort of in the portal triad? How does it move through the liver? Central vein and, and the caudal vena cava finally lands up there. Yep. Central central vein. Yep. Also known as central vein and then hepatic vein. Good. Excellent. And then cava. So the only significance of that is that I do a lot of ultrasounds. So the ones that we can see are the hepatic veins. Um, okay, so we've got the kind of blood flow idea and I want you, I really want everybody to be across the concept that the splanchnic circulation, so the splenic vein and all of the vessels coming from the gastrointestinal tract all of those vessels drain through the liver. It's a huge sieve and virtually nothing gets into circulation, into systemic circulation without having been through that sieve because it's all shunted through the portal vein. So it's a really important concept that essentially the blood supply to the liver is very different to the blood supply to every other organ in the body. And I sort of picture it because I like a picture as two trees, so portal, brings the blood up to the liver and then all the branches come out like this and then the hepatic veins 
and central veins intersect and then it goes to the tree the tree trunk sort of upside down that way it goes up to the caver um so i think it's just a really important concept to have did everybody was everybody clear on that before good excellent it's obviously you know when there's shunting vessels it's why it's so significant because it's such abnormal blood getting into the rest of the the body as far as anatomy of the liver i don't think it's really important that you all know names of lobes and things like that um but essentially there's left left lobe right lobe and then there's the chordate and quadrate um lobes or processes of lobes um and they surround the gallbladder, obviously. Does anyone want to go into more anatomy than that? I don't think it's very examinable, to be honest. Um, we're going to talk more about the, the, um, the zones of the liver when we talk about hepatitis. So I don't want to go too much into microscopic anatomy unless anybody thinks it's a high risk for a question and we can go into it now. I don't think it really is. Okay. They can't ask us to draw a diagram, so I'm thinking no. They can't ask you to draw diagrams. Mm. Not oh, on the wow. computer. So. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's a no. Great. Okay. Um, all right, let's go into clinical signs of liver disease. So literally clinical signs. So no blood results or anything like that. The patient presents to you and it has liver disease. We don't know that yet. What are its clinical signs that we should be looking out for? The cat or a dog? The dog. Morning, anorexia, lethargy, jaundice. Good. It's CPUPD. Great, excellent. We've got vomiting. Ascites. Good. Seizures. Good. Urine uh, pigmenturia. Urine pigmenturia, did you say? Yeah. Yep. Excellent. And crystalluria. Yes. What sort of mm. crystals? Urea crystals. Good. Excellent. We've missed one big clinical sign. Vomiting and diarrhea. Good, thank you. Um, okay. Jaundice. Again. Possibly jaundice. Jaundice, good. Somebody did say it to us. Um, Hemorrhage, petechia. Very good, excellent. Um, petechia, uh, hemorrhage, absolutely. Would we be likely to see petechia with primary liver disease? No. Why? Um, That's a platelet dysfunction. Uh, yeah. Yes. It's exactly. not a quiet, it's, it's not due to clotting factor. Um, exactly. or yeah, so it's not impossible. We do, and particularly when um, animals have had blood collected and things like that, we do see ecchymosis and small skin bruises with mm. secondary um, coagula Co coagula co coagulopathies of the um, coagulation factors, but petechia and ecchymosis are quite unique to prime def defects of primary hemostasis, which include platelets, endothelium, and von Willebrand. Mm -hmm. um, um, abdominal pain. Yep. And there's one more big one. Uh, seizures. Somebody said seizures, actually, but it's on that track. It's mental uh, confusion postprandial. Yeah, exactly. What do we call it? Hepatic encephalopathy. Good. Excellent. Thank you. Um, what's the most common sign of hepatic encephalopathy? Lethargy. Ooh, a little bit more specific sign. Sorry, lethargy is probably correct. Uh, it's uh, reported to be central blindness, which comes and goes. So mm. they often. So disorientation. Um, sorry, Matt, say again. Disorientation. 
Yes, exactly. Yeah. Um, so yes, comes and goes. Um, good. Is that you saying that actually you have central blindness that's intermittent? Uh, that's, it's not persistent. It, it's usually when their encephalopath encephalopathy flares up, so postprandially, right. and okay. part of the kind of neuro presentation is blind, essentially bumping into. Oh. Them. Wow. And people say, oh, I thought they were just clumsy. Um, all right. So now that we've got our patient in and we've used our crystal ball and know that it already has liver disease, um, let's talk about how we test for the different forms of liver disease. So this patient comes in and it's a, I'm going to use a, case uh sorry uh, an example from a paper sorry i don't know what's going on in my house it sounds like there's a fairy foghorn downstairs um so i think it's a 2018 paper if anybody's doing past papers there was a three-year-old german shepherd presented with um uh i think it was vomiting and diarrhea and it had, it had been put on carprofen a few weeks before and had been on not a few weeks before Pooja. No, Pooja no, no, no. It was clean. He was clinically well. He had come for vaccination oh. and then bloods were done and the were... Oh, right, 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 right. Okay, beg your pardon. Um, you probably know this question better than me. I should have opened up the paper so that I could read it. Um, so this dog's been on phenobarbitone for seizures for lifelong. And it's on, it's been put on carotene very recently. And do you remember the, the kind of levels of abnormalities, Pooja? Mm, they were moderate, but I don't remember numbers. I can look it up quickly. Sorry, thank you. I could probably just make it up. So, sorry, you cut out there. Did you say it was on carprofen and phenobarbital? Had been on phenobarb long-term, carprofen short-term. His ALT was 726 and his AP was 931. Excellent. Okay. So how do you interpret the ALT and ALP in this case as far as determining the significance to this patient, this well patient? Is there a baseline from before the cup open? Not that they give us. Mm -hmm. And it's a German Shepherd. It could easily have a reactive hepatotomy. Sorry. I found this question really hard for the record when I read it. Um, uh, okay, so tell me about ALT. Where is it secreted from? Secreted is the wrong word. Cytoplasm. Cytoplasm, good, excellent. In response to what? Damage. Good. Of which cells? Hepatocellular cells, hepatocytes. Yes, good. Um, excellent. So when we've got an ALT elevation of 726, is it mild, moderate, or marked? Moderate. Moderate. Is it? Mm-hmm. I don't think so. Is it? Oh, no, you're right. You're right. You're right. God. Mm, yeah. Sorry. Tenfold and over is severe, I think. Uh, five to ten is moderate. Exactly. And less than five is mild. It's, so it's borderline mild to moderate, I would say, if the upper limit's 120. Um, so we've got a moderate ALT elevation. So we've got moderate hepatocellular damage. Um, what, in determining whether this dog is likely to have a hepatotoxicity associated with its medication versus another process going on, um, I don't know how to word this question. Sorry. Let's just bench that for a sec. <laughs> Sorry. And talk about ALP. Where does ALP come from? How do we membrane? I think. Uh, Which cell? Sorry, Josh. The, isn't it the, the canalicular membrane of the parasites? Yeah. Or, yeah, the lining. I thought you said that. I just didn't hear it clearly. 
Um, so perfect. And is it secreted in the same way as ALT or? No, I don't think so. I think it's, um, it's similar to GTT. Yes, excellent. So as far as sort of when you see, when you've got an injury. It's not a leakage enzyme, is that what you mean? Like it's not exactly. leaking from a cell. Exactly. Um, so it's produced in response to an injury. So as far as sort of the timing of when those um, enzymes become elevated, the ALP is usually a little bit delayed behind because it has to be produced in response to that injury. So when we... We know that ALP comes from the biliary system, from the canaliculi. We know that ALT comes from the hepatocytes themselves. Did any of you guys read the, deto the um, detoxification chapter for Ben and No? Um, they, they do a really nice summary of working out whether a toxicity is hepatocellular or, um, or colostatic or mixed. Has anybody seen the formula for the R value? No, it's essentially a ratio between ALT and ALP. And there's a formula just to make it really complicated. But essentially, if you've got a ratio of ALT to ALP that's five to one, then it's um, likely to be hepatocellular. If you've got a ratio that's one to five, it's likely to be cholestatic. And then between two and five, it's likely to be mixed. So a toxicity that's injuring both. Yeah, that's right. Sorry. Um, so if, if the, sorry, if the ratio is closer to one to one, um, it's likely to be a mixed um, cholestatic and hepatotoxic injury. So in this dog, on its carprofen and on its phenobarbitone, can somebody review whether we've got hepatotoxic or cholestatic injury? I'd be suspicious of chronic ALP elevation due to phenobarbitone use. Excellent. Yeah. And acute hepatotoxicity from the idiosyncratic reaction to carprofen. That is an excellent answer. Um, so how are we going to prove our theory right? Anna, I have a question regarding this. Yeah. This dog also has hip dysplasia and we know ALP also has a bone isomer. So how much would that play a role? Um, that's a really good question. But to make ALP elevated from a bone um, isomer, the bone has to be melting away. Okay. So it's very rare. Osteoarthritis typically causes a proliferative change in the joints. It's not lytic. So in, in conditions like osteosarcoma, where there's a, a significant lytic component, then we can get elevated ALP, but away virtually zero. Okay. But how old is this dog again? Sorry, this puppy? Three. Three. Oh, three years old. Okay, so we're not during rapid growth phase of ALP. being no. Yeah, gotcha. Um, so, so if the dog's clinically well, would you de-escalate the carprofen and recheck bloods three weeks later? Yeah, that's exactly what I do. Um, do we do hepatoprotectants in this situation? Um, yeah. I think I would. Yeah. It would be nice to have AST as well. I think that would have, would be helpful. They might have given that to us, but I can't remember. Yeah. And, and my internet dropped out at the crucial moment. The ratios, I lost that. Right. Um, can I, have you got the Edinger? Um, they've got a really nice summary of that in the detoxification chapter and it will give you the proper formula. But essentially, if you've got, they talk about this R value, but it, it looks at sort of if ALT is five times ALP, then it's, hepato, it's hepatocellular damage. It's primarily hepatotoxic. If the ALP is five times higher than ALT, it's predominantly cholestatic toxicity. So then you can kind of, between the two drugs that this dog's on, phenobarbitone typically causes ALP elevation, whereas carprofen typically causes ALT elevation. So we can't say that both of these liver enzyme elevations are from one drug. 
So if you've then got a ratio of sort of one to one, you've either got a mixed toxicity that's causing hepatocellular and cholestatic disease, or you've got two different toxicities. Right. Does that make sense? Um, but that, that's a, it's a really interesting chapter, the de detox chapter. I just think I admire the liver greatly after reading that. Um, well worth a read. Okay, we talked about ALT, we talked about ALP. AST, how does that differ from ALT in terms of the information it gives us? It's released from the mitochondria, so I think you need to have cellular death. Yeah. How does cellular death? Yeah, so it's elevated with more severe injuries than with um, hepatotoxic, uh, than with ALT. Um, okay, and what about, is AST specific for the liver? No. No, it comes from muscle. Good, excellent. So what other... Um, parameter do you need on your blood result to determine whether AST is likely to be muscle, AST, sorry, elevation is likely to be muscle or liver? CKK. Excellent. Good. So how many clinic, how many people have CK on their normal baseline profile in their clinics? You have to add it on. You have to add it on, don't you? Yeah. That's such an oversight in my opinion. Um, especially working in critical care when you see snake bites and stuff like that. Um, okay. Any more questions about liver enzymes, GGT? Is, um, I've got a question on AS, ALT to AST ratios. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it may be out of fashion or deemed uh, not predictable enough, but um, whether there's a if there's a high level of AST relative to ALT, assume CK is normal, that the picture may be increase your clinical index of clinical suspicion of neoplasia versus hepatitis. Have you heard about that, or is that kind of out of fashion? I actually haven't seen that, and I don't really know how that would work because AST is produced with cell death, like Bron said. So that's yeah. why it would be more elevated in neoplasia than it would be in hepatitis. Mm. I feel like it could be a mitochondrial dysfunction marker. But, I, yeah, I remember sort of someone saying that, like I remember I had a case once that I rang someone about maybe at a lab or something. This is years ago. And, and the AST was 800 and the ALT was 400. And they're like, oh, neoplasia. And it was. Wow. And it's like, oh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, I will be looking out for that, but it's not been my observation right now, and I haven't come across that Fair uh, enough. research. Yeah. Um, Cushing's yeah. disease will send the ALP up a lot and the ALT a bit, more or less. I've never worked out ratios, but I'll do that in the future. Yeah, it's a really nice thing to do. Um, Cushing's disease, the mechanism that it causes elevations in liver enzymes, um, what would you expect to be more elevated? ALP. ALP. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so it's predominantly a cholestatic disorder. Um, then we get, obviously the liver gets enlarged because of um, fat and glycogen storage because the we're going to talk about this more when we do Cushing's and it's probably kind of going off topic a little bit. Um, but certainly ALP elevation is probably the most common reason we do abdominal ultrasounds is trying to work out whether it's significant or not. And it's just so non-specific for either liver disease. So if you look at all of the dogs with ALP elevations, only 50% of them have any actual liver disease on biopsy. And the other 50%, it's just a random elevation that hopefully will go away. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I mean, it, do you think it'll end up being more like non-alcoholic fatty liver disease in humans? Like it's insulin, it's part of metabolic syndrome, insulin resistant driven? No, uh, well, yes, or I think. Hepatitis. I think absolutely. <laughs> Hyperlipidemia is underdiagnosed again because triglycerides aren't part of a normal panel in one big external lab, even, even let alone internally. Um, so, yes, I do think hyperlipidemia impact on liver is causing ALP elevations that we're not detecting. But these 50% of dogs have liver biopsies which show no liver changes and they've got mm -hmm. ALP elevations. So the ones that you're talking about still fall into the 50%. Yeah. 
Sure, because there's still lot, the changes. mythological changes. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, uh, so ALP, what other things can cause ALP elevation? We talked about bone. Bone turnover, yeah. Steroid. <clears throat> yeah, excellent. Um, and what causes steroid excess? Exogenous steroids. Stress. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exogenous um, steroids, stress. What's the most common cause of stress we see in patients as vets? Inflammation. Nick. Inflammation, illness. Yeah, exactly. So if you've got a dog that's got grade five dental disease, does it go up to grade five? <laughs> 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 Sorry, I glitched when I said that. <laughs> Good. Um, very high grade dental disease. Um, and you've got an ALP elevation. I don't think that's surprising at all if you've got um, a lot of inflammation in the mouth. No, uh, so that's due to the impact on cortisol. Yeah, then, absolutely. Physiologic stress, uh, illness. And, stress. and then therefore fat deposits and cholestasis because of the fat in the liver. Yeah, so right. that's probably a little bit of a, a long bow. So mm. I think we'll probably get a mild ALP elevation associated with the steroid isoenzyme. Uh, initially and then the result of increased cortisol levels chronically will yeah. lead to increased fat storage increased fat yeah. storage in the liver which causes hepatomegaly and swelling of the hepatocytes because they're full of stuff which causes cholestasis so that's the kind of order of things um but it's got to be quite a lot of steroid before we get liver changes like primary liver changes okay um, does anybody have any more questions about the, those liver enzymes? No. Okay. I'm going to ask you an exam question. List the tests available, the biochemical tests available for determining liver function. Urea, cholesterol, albumin, uh, urea, cholesterol, albumin, and one more. Glucose. Glucose, thank you. <laughs> Lovely, excellent. Bile acid testing. Good, excellent. Ammonia. Good. Coagulation tests. Excellent. One more. Ammonia tolerance test in case the yeah. ammonia test not um, doesn't give you an answer. Good. Yeah. That wasn't the one I was thinking of first. Sorry. It's a biggie. It's on every biochem panel. Billy Rubin. Good. Excellent so easy to miss things in an exam setting when they kind of don't fall into your categories you know what i mean so why is bilirubin a test of liver function bilirubin is conjugated in the liver and then excreted by the bile exactly yeah so what are the causes of bilirubin um, elevations pre-hepatic hepatic post-hepatic excellent very good um Excellent. All right. So let's talk about a patient that walks in to your clinic and is generally well, according to Yona, a 13-year-old Jack Russell. And the owner says, oh, he has been drinking a lot more than usual and weighing through the night. He's weighing in the bed and the wee is really yellow. And you look at your patient and he has icterus. You do bloods and he has a mild ALT elevation, a moderate ALP elevation, and a bilirubin of 80, so marked bilirubin elevation. Are you expecting this dog who walked into your clinic and is generally well to have a low glucose level? 
can do because you can can't you compensate with your con counter uh, regulatory hormones so you can have um, waxing and waning hypoglycemia norm normal glycemia um in with how do you know how much of the liver function you need to lose to develop hypoglycemia is it 80 yeah it's huge so they're pretty end stage by the time they've got hypoglycemia but i think that's one of the last liver function tests to go down and particularly in a clinical situation where they've got a bit of a catecholamine surge and you restrain the bloods and things, you, it's pretty rare that we see hypoglycemia associated with liver disease. What about urea? Does it go down early or late in the course of liver disease? Late. Late, good, exactly. What is urea from? Why does it? Why does production go down when liver function goes down? Tell me about the urea cycle. So it's um, made from ammonia in the urea cycle. So, and the liver does that mainly. Good. Excellent. Very good. Um, excellent. So if we've got a low urea, What's our ammonia likely to be? All right. Good. So by the time we've got low urea, typically we've got shunting of blood essentially or increased ammonia in circulation because that low urea says that that ammonia is not getting processed. It's not that it's not getting produced. It's coming from the colon. That's still working. Mm -hmm. um, so that's a good test to kind of, if you see a low urea on your biochem, go to an ammonia level. Um. What about albumin? Will that go down early or late in liver disease or in the middle? Moderate. Moderate. Yeah, I agree. Um, these are very non-specific, and you'd never get asked this in an exam, but I think it's good to just understand clinically at what stage different things happen. So I wouldn't be surprised if this dog had mildly low albumin and um, urea, but I would be surprised if it had low glucose just because that's so end stage. Um, what about cholesterol? Earlier. Earlier. It can do. What about if the primary liver problem is cholestatic? It could be high. could be high. So we go through this sort of transition phase where we've got a primary he cholestatic hepatopathy and the cholesterol can't be excreted. So you end up with a high cholesterol. And then as liver function drops off, you end up with a low cholesterol. Um, so it can, can go down moderate with moderately severe liver disease but it can it, it tends to be later in in liver disease just because of the cholestatic component um okay describe exam question describe the um ex, uh, the mechanism of an elevated bile acid test in liver disease, postprandial bile acid test in liver disease, describing the pathway of excretion and metabolism of bile acids. So you have the bile acids being secreted through the bile into the gastrointestinal system, which is then retaken up into the portal system through the, and back to the liver and most of it shouldn't go back into the systemic circulation so they should be lower excellent um so where in the gastrointestinal tract are they absorbed the ilia very good excellent and the only significance of that is if you've got uh for example cats get their ibd and lympho in the distal ilium dogs often get their foreign bodies in the distal ilium and have had part of the ilium resected um, so there are other reasons why bile acid test might not work because other absorption is um, inadequate of those bile acids. Um, it, what, in what situations will bile acid 
uh, when is doing a bile acid test contraindicated? When the ammonia is already high. Or if they're jaundiced. Yeah, excellent. So why wouldn't you do a bile acid when they're jaundiced? Because of cholestasis potential. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we've all, we already know that the bile acid circulation is broken because the bilirubin is not being excreted and therefore the bile acids aren't going to be excreted and therefore we're not going to be able to measure bile acid absorption and transmission into systemic circulation. Make sense? Um, what artifactual, um, what artifacts might impact the accuracy of your bile acid test? I don't know if you could call it an artifact, but um, premature contraction in, in the fasting phase. Excellent. Good. So that might, if you were doing a paired bile acid, pre and postprandial, what would that look like potentially if you had contraction in the fasting phase? So pre, the pre. Pre would be higher than the post then? Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's actually not uncommon. Um, it does mean that it's harder to sort of interpret the post because the gallbladder had already contracted sort of thing, but it, it's not a, not a deal breaker. Um, or if you haven't fed a, a fatty enough meal, then because it's the fat that sort of gives the signal for the uh, contraction of the gallbladder. So if you don't have a fatty meal, then there may not be a signal. Yeah. A strong signal, whatever. So the, the artifact that I was getting at, um, which will potentially cause a falsely elevated bile acid reading is actually lipemia. So you have to feed a fatty meal to get the gallbladder to contract, but then you have lipemia, which falsely increases your bile acid level. So feeding the right amount is quite important and feeding the right ratios of protein to fat because protein will also trigger contraction um, is important. Um, any other... Oh, okay. Is is um, it has it been sort of phased out from more recent evidence that breed will alter arresting bile acid, like Maltese? That's that's kind of been disproven, has it? That that they might have a higher arresting bile acid. Uh, good question. Or random acid. Very good question. So, um, bile acid is quite a specific test for liver dysfunction, um, and certainly there are breeds that have all of them have liver dysfunction and therefore all of them have elevated bile acids. Um, so we sort of said bile, you can't do bile acids in Maltese, but that's because they've all got microvascular dysplasia essentially. Mm -hmm. um, so the other breeds that are potentially prone to that are Harvanese and Dandy Dinmont, I think was on the list as well. I don't see many of them. <laughs> um, but it would definitely worth looking up the breed specific kind of quirks of your bile acid test. Um, so let's talk about if you've got an elevated bile acid, postprandial is over 100, upper end is 25. And you've got a young, uh, healthy patient who has small stature and has intermittent blindness after eating. <laughs> How sure are you of your diagnosis? Or what is your diagnosis? Shunt. Yeah. Congenital shunt. Congenital shunt. How sure are you of that? High index. Yeah. Bile acids over 100 is pretty much it's a shunt. Mm. So it might not, it might be an acquired shunt secondary to really severe cirrhosis, hepatitis and cirrhosis, but it's a shunt. And, and if you put sorry, young dog with the I was saying it's probably a bit young for, for that to be a high likelihood unless it had a major history of acute toxicosis. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly right. Um, excellent. So bile acids are quite specific for, for shunting. Um, at, at, that high, at that high elevation, like the graph uh, of the pre post is up here, whereas other conditions are further down here. Exactly. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So things like hepatitis and things where we're starting to get a little bit of like microvascular dysplasia and, and maybe a little bit of blood shunting 
um, or a little bit of uh, decreased excretion from cholestasis. Um, they can be mildly elevated, but not over 100. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So does anybody have any more questions or anything else they want to talk about with regards to um, liver function testing? Nope. Okay. Um, does anyone want to talk about coagulation? Because I have bias here and I love talking about coagulation with liver disease. Nope. <laughs> I don't really know how they would put it in an exam question. I think it would be a really harsh exam question for memberships. But if I was a fellowship examiner, mark my words, Joshua, um, <laughs> I would say describe the... Um, describe the impacts on the coagulation system of severe primary liver dysfunction. Um, and there's lots of different mechanisms for how it might cause coagulation dysregulation. And interestingly, in humans, a um, hepatitis is associated with immune-mediated thrombocytopenia. It's a trigger of it. Um, and it happens often in juveniles. And I saw one case of a dog with hepatitis and IMTP, which was almost certainly a coincidence, but I went down a rabbit hole and got really excited. I have one of those currently. Yeah, I, I think I've seen that too. <gasps> that's, that's when when I said, um, when you were asking for other symptoms, when I was like... Uh, uh, the DKA, yeah. Like, yeah, that's what that's because I've seen it. Um, yeah, seen it before too. Mm. Um, there was, I think this is a thing. Uh, there was a question in the chat um, uh, from Maria. Yeah. Uh, uh, I don't know if her audio is not working. Uh, what level of bilirubin, uh, a level of bilirubin elevation do we see icterus? Um, Good question. Um, so blood bilirubin and tissue bilirubin aren't necessarily correlated. Um, so obviously... To, for the bilirubin to get into the tissues, and the blood bilirubin has to get quite high and then it gets deposited in the tissues and it takes much longer to leave the tissues than it does to leave the blood, to get excreted from the blood. Um, we don't really see clinical icterus unless they're over 50. Um, we have yellow walls in our clinic, which mean that every dog I look at looks like it has icterus because um, the sclera affect the thing. So I'm very sensitive at picking up uterus. Um, but, yeah, usually over 50. Some By the time it's getting to 70, it's getting pretty obvious um, when they're icteric. Does that answer your question? Short answer, it's quite elevated before we see it clinically. She said, yes, thank you. Microphone struggling. Oh, <laughs> Jane. Okay, so I want to cover a little bit of the detoxification well of, of the way that toxins can impact the liver. And I think the light bulb moment for me with this chapter, and it was in the, the, the extra reading, the CVT current veterinary therapy edition 15 chapter on um, detoxification by the same author as the Edinger chapter, um, where she talks about how detoxification occurs and the reason why i think it's so relevant is because it's essentially um it helps you understand the therapeutic um the reasons why we use SAMI and antioxidant agents and things like that so there's two steps whenever a xenobiotic is uh, absorbed from the gastrointestinal tract, goes into the portal system, up the portal, triad, and then hits the hepatocytes. It, the, those substances are modified. So within the hepatocyte, they're modified to, in all sorts of different ways, depending on which enzyme system they activate. And in 80% of cases, that's the cytochrome, cytochrome P450 system. You heard about that? Mm -hmm. To be honest, I don't really know what that means, but I know it's an enzyme system which changes things. 
And the ways in which enzymes get changed, it's really easy to get bogged down in that. And when you're reading about one specific drug, it says then it gets hydro hydrogenated to this and then it gets blah, blah, blah to this. But essentially simplifying that, cytochrome P450 deals with 80% of the toxins that are or the metabolites and antibiotics that are absorbed. And it changes them in one of several ways, which can be taking away a hydrogen, adding a hydrogen, um, uh, oxidizing, um, reducing, uh, essentially changing their structure. Now, the xenobiotic that was absorbed may have been the toxin and changing it may decrease the risk of toxicity. On the flip side of that, the xenobiotic might be completely inert and not cause any effect. And the way that the cytochrome system changes it, changes it into its active metabolite, which is the one that has the impact on, on either hepatocytes or the rest of the body. So the first step when a xenobiotic is absorbed is modification. And that's usually via that cytochrome P450 system. And there's really nice lists of substrates of that system if you're ever interested. Uh, and then the second step is excretion of that modified metabolite. And the way that the liver uh, I've lost my words. Um, the way that the liver allows that to happen is by binding that metabolite to something that's water soluble to allow excretion. So what um, What would it do? Do any of you know what the liver binds toxins to or metabolites to for excretion? Albumin. Oh, good. It's actually for circulation. So okay. if it's allowing it to get out of circulation, but these ones are more being excreted, I think excreted back into the bile. We're trying to get rid of these ones. These are the bad ones. This big cholesterol. Ooh, close, but we're thinking water soluble, whereas cholesterol is fat. Bile salts. Uh, they end up bound to bile salts, but before they hit the bile salt stage, still within the hepatocyte. Like urobilogen now? No, no. <laughs> too far? Too far. You're too far down the track. You're already in the biliary system. We're still in the hepatocyte. Um, methyl? methyl? Is it methyl donors? Ooh, thiol donors. Wow. Yes, good. So the main two substances that the hepatocyte binds the metabolites to are glutathione or glucuronidase, glucuronic acid. Yeah. So the reason why these two things are really important, does anybody know how SAMI works? It's to help the production of glutathione, is it? Exactly, exactly. So really targeted effect on detoxification. Um, so by increasing or supporting glucuronidation and glutathione binding, you are aiding detoxification process, regardless of whether the primary xenobiotic was the toxin or the metabolite was a toxin, you're getting rid of it faster, which is the objective. So if we've got a toxic metabolite sitting in the hepatocyte and we've already saturated our capacity, we've used up all our glutathione or used up all our um, capacity for glucuronidation, what's going to happen to that hepatocyte? Will it get oxidative damage? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. So this is where I get really excited about the anatomy of the liver. So if you've got a toxin that's coming in via the portal system, where is going to, which sort of region, is it going to be the area surrounding the portal system or is it going to be the area surrounding the central vein that is getting hit hardest with that um, hepatocellular damage associated with that toxin. Very portal. Very portal. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Good. If you've got a 
primary cholestatic process and a problem with excretion of the toxin in the biliary system. So we've got um, sluggish flow, flow in our um, canaliculi and then we've got that toxin in contact with hepatocytes. It's bound already. Um, where are we going to get the inflammation? Central, right on the central uh, veins. Exactly. So if you've got a primary hepatotoxin, we've got inflammation around the portal tract, portal triad. If you've got a cholestatic disease, mm. you've got inflammation around the central vein. And it's a really nice reason to do biopsies if it's safe for the patient to try and work out the mechanism of toxicity if you're not sure what the toxin is. Um, does anybody want to talk more about toxicity? That's sort of all I wanted to cover because I find it really exciting. The, y yes. Um, I mean, the secondary one, um, is that would we'll call, is that enough to call it a pro drug, or does it have to happen further downstream in the enterohepatic circulation where the metabolites turned into a toxic metabolite? Is it is it, is that a pro drug at that stage? Pro drug is the one that's before the active metabolite, whether the active metabolite's a toxin or an active ingredient. Yeah. Does that make sense? So it could be at this at this place, like in the phase. To, like the, and with the phases of liver detoxification, um, when when it's bound to something, is that the conjugation phase or you? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Conjugation happens. Oh god. Because I think in humans they talk about like phase one, two, and three liver detoxification, and then I think the first first phase is is um your yeah, um you. conjugation, and then the then I think it's liver, and then gut maybe. Not, or is it all? I don't know, to be honest. I think it's probably a different model than I've seen before. Yeah. So where where does the um, cytochrome P450 happen in that model? Um, I think uh, phase one. Okay, so that's hepatic. Mm. And that's prior to conjugation. It must be because they can't change it after it's conjugated. It's locked mm. in. I'll have to review it. Yeah, yeah. interesting. I'm interested to see that model. Um, all right. Does anybody have any more exam style questions that they want to cover? Um, so it's, it's this week, isn't it? Next week. Yeah. Thursday. Okay. <sighs> um, so we talked last week about, or last fortnight, about doing a practice oral exams, uh, exam next Friday. Is that too soon? Is that all right? Yep. Yeah. You're not all going to be going, ooh, it's terrible <laughs> on Friday. We're going to have a debrief before we do the practice exam. <laughs> um, so let's schedule that for 8 o'clock next Friday. Um, if you have any specific areas that you really want to focus on, I'm really happy to steer my questions in that direction. But I will be doing it exam conditions. I'll have a PowerPoint. I'll put the questions out exactly as we do the oral exam, like as if you're in the exam, so that you can see sort of how it will unfold. Um, I'll have an answer key and I'll try and act like an examiner. Uh, I don't do very well. Um, uh, so yes, please do email me through anything if you want to talk about anything specific. Mm -hmm. um, and I might actually limit that. Um, I'm happy for anybody to sign in, but I want only membership candidates to contribute to the conversation, please. Mm -hmm. All right, great. I'll send out an invite for that. Thanks so much. Thank you. No worries. Thank you. Anna. Thank Thanks, you. Anna. Thanks, Thanks. Have a good Bye. day, everyone. You too. Bye.